On the evening of Good Friday, April the 14th, 1865, as President Abraham Lincoln and his wife Mary Todd enjoyed our American cousin at the Ford's Theater, famous stage actor and Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth approached the president from behind and shot him in the back of the head. With the president slumped in his chair and chaos ensuing, Booth made the 12-foot jump to the stage, injuring himself in the process, and screamed, Sick Semper Tyrannus! Thus, always to tyrants. Proving Ben Franklin's original idea for the official slogan of the US being rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God would have been a bad idea. Pushing his way through the crowd, Booth jumped onto his horse and escaped into the night. All that is fairly commonly known. What is not as well known is that this wasn't the only violent assassination attempt on a government official that night. John Wilkes Booth and his fellow conspirators had a much greater plan in place, one that if it had been properly executed could have thrown the newly reunited country into anarchy. In November of 1864, a Confederate victory was slipping away. The Emancipation Proclamation, issued 18 months prior, was ending the South's power, and Abraham Lincoln was overwhelmingly re-elected as President of the United States. An enraged John Wilkes Booth rounded up others with the same political alliances as, as him to conspire on how to put a stop to all of this. Meeting regularly at Ms. Mary Surratt's boarding house in Washington, Booth's motley crew, among others, included a young, handsome Confederate soldier by the name of Lewis Powell and an alcoholic named George Atzerott. Lewis Powell was born in Alabama, but moved all across the southern states as a child due to his father being a traveling Baptist minister. At 17, he joins the Confederate Army. He was wounded and captured by Union forces at the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. While in Baltimore Union Hospital, he romantically befriended a young volunteer Union nurse by the name of Margaret Branson, who helped him escape. He made his way south to behind enemy lines in Virginia. He moved back to Baltimore under the alias Payne, where he met up with Branson. Later, he was arrested for violently beating a black maid, only to be let off due to a lack of witnesses. Eventually, he aligned with the Confederate operative David Parr, who introduced him to John Surratt, Mary's son, who introduced him to Booth. George Atzerott was completely different than Powell. Born in Germany, he immigrated to America with his family in 1843 at the age of eight. He opened a carriage repair business in Port Tobacco, Maryland. His business would fail, and he would spend his days drinking and feeling sorry for himself. Later, during Atzerott's trial, a fellow Port Tobacco resident who had been called as a witness described Atzerott as a notorious coward and was known around town as someone people could not rely on. Whether this was true or not, during the war he assisted Confederacy agents and met John Sir and then John Wilkes Booth. They allowed him to stay at Mary Surratt's boarding house, though he would be kicked out later for drinking alcohol in the house. Booth, with Powell, Lancerot, Surratt, and several others by his side, came up with his first plan to stop the Northern invasion. Booth and his co-conspirators would kidnap the president, Abraham Lincoln, and use him as exchange for Confederate prisoners of war. According to Booth's inside information, the president was to attend the play as the waters run deep at Campbell Military Hospital near Washington on March 17, 1865. On that day, Booth and his men assembled on the outskirts of town in various strategic positions to intercept the president's carriage, but when he never showed. Booth would later find out at the last minute that the president had changed his plans. Instead of attending the play, he attended a ceremony in which he presented the 142nd Indiana Infantry with a captured Confederate flag. Had Lincoln not changed his plans that day, American history may have been rather different. Upon this failure, Booth and his conspirators developed a new and more bold plan. They would assassinate the president and several of his highest ranking officials. Booth himself would take the president, but he needed his co conspirators to go after the other government officials. Powell wanted violent chaos, Atzerott wanted a new reputation. Both of these men volunteered to be Booth's most important co-conspirators. Booth gave Powell the task of murdering the Secretary of State William Seward at his home in Auburn, New York. Seward was an easy target, as he was more or less bedridden, having been recently badly injured in a carriage accident. Booth assigned Adzadot the task of assassinating Vice President Andrew Johnson. The same night Booth shot Lincoln, Powell arrived at the Seward household at approximately 10 p.m. Two hours earlier, Booth had met with Powell to give him a gun, a knife, and his getaway horse. Calmly knocking on the door, Powell waited for someone to answer. William Bell, a servant, opened the door, at which point Powell explained that he had medicine for the Secretary of State that required urgent delivery. Bell refused Powell entrance, at which point Powell pushed his way past Bell, only to be confronted by Frederick Seward, William Seward's son. Frederick told Powell that he would take the medicine. Not to be dissuaded, Powell clubbed Frederick in the head with his gun, and he'd be in a coma for 60 days, but would eventually recover. On his mad dash to William Seward's room, he slashed George Robinson, a bodyguard in the face, and screamed, I'm mad! I'm mad. 
He made it to Seward and was able to stab and slash at the neck and face of the Secretary of State several times before being thrown off. Powell then fled, attacking those he encountered on his way out of the house, and he made it to his getaway horse, where he was able to escape. That is, until two days later on April the 17th, when he was arrested. Despite the wounds to five people in Powell's rampage, they all survived, including Seward. On the morning of April the 14th, George Atzadot checked into the Kirkwood Hotel under his own name. Vice President Andrew Johnson was also to be in the Kirkwood Hotel that evening. Atzadot spends all day thinking, considering, and working up the courage for the task at hand. 10 p.m. rolled around, and Atzadot decided a little liquid courage might be helpful. Thus, he went to the bar rather than going to find Andrew Johnson. For the next several hours, he drank himself silly and then wandered the streets of Washington aimlessly, mumbling to himself. He never even attempted to take the life of Andrew Johnson. However, at one point, he did ask a bartender about the whereabouts of the vice president. This led to his arrest a day later when the bartender called the authorities, saying a suspicious-looking man in a gray coat had seemed to be up to no good and had inquired about the vice president. On July the 7th, 1865, Lewis Powell, George Adzadot, Mary Surratt, the first woman to be executed by the U.S. federal government, and David Herald, were hung at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C. as co-conspirators in a plot to assassinate high-ranking government officials. John Wilkes Booth did not join them on the gallows. He had been tracked as a fugitive and shot to death on April 26, 1865. Today, you can still visit Ford's Theatre, the site of Lincoln's assassination, and the Seward House in Auburn, New York, where you can walk up the very same stairs Lewis Powell used in his failed attempt on William Seward's life. And now for a bonus fact. It turns out Lincoln came centimeters from being assassinated approximately nine months before he was actually assassinated. So how did this happen? Throughout the Civil War, President Lincoln and his family spent the summer and fall in a cottage on the grounds of the soldiers' home in the country outside of Washington, D.C. Relatively isolated and poorly guarded, Lincoln was dismissive of any danger to himself or his family. He is reputed to have said, It would never do for a president to have guards with drawn sabers at his door, as if he fancied he were an emperor. Many in his administration were concerned about the lack of security and on occasion took matters into their own hands, as reported by a friend. The president and his family have been living out at the soldier's home about four miles only, this side of the rebel line of skirmishers, but on Sunday night, Secretary Stanton sent out a carriage and a guard and brought in the family, who are again domesticated at the White House. The lonely situation of the president's summer residence would have afforded a tempting chance for a daring squad of rebel cavalry to run some risks for the chance of carrying off the president, whom we could ill afford to spare right now. Of course, Lincoln did have a contingent of guards, a part of Company K of the 150th Pennsylvania Volunteers. Remaining assigned to the president from 1862 until his death in 1865, the president's bodyguard developed a friendly relationship with him. Nonetheless, he disliked it when they accompanied him during his commute to the White House. In his typical wry style, Lincoln complained to the Army Chief of Staff Henry Halleck that he was more afraid of being shot by the accidental discharge of one of the new recruit's carbines or revolvers than of any attempt on his life. Even with the assigned guard, Lincoln frequently slipped away and commuted back and forth to the cottage alone. On many occasions, he even enjoyed a lonely midnight ride to an evening destination like the Naval Observatory in Foggy Bottom. And it was during one of these lonely rides back to Soldier's Home one night in August when an attempt was made on the president's life. Riding slowly on the road that led to the entrance to the grounds, a rifle shot approximately 50 yards away startled his horse. Old Abe, the horse, took off at what the president called breakneck speed, which unceremoniously separated me from my $8 plug hat, with which I parted company without any assent, express or implied. When he arrived at the soldier's home at about 11 o'clock that evening, he met Private John W. Nichols, whom he knew. Nichols noticed that the president was bareheaded and riding briskly. When he asked, the president mentioned the rifle shot and that the quick jump of his startled horse jerked his hat off. Later, Nichols and another soldier went searching and found the hat with a bullet hole in it. Nichols presented the hat to Lincoln, who was dismissive of the danger. When his friend, Ward Hill Lamon, expressed concern, Lincoln remained convinced that it was just an accident. He said, now, in the face of this testimony in favor of your theory of danger to me personally, I can't bring myself to believe that anyone has shot or will deliberately shoot at me with the purpose of killing me, although I must acknowledge that I heard this fellow's bullet whistle at an uncomfortably short distance from these headquarters of mine. I have about concluded that the shot was the result of accidents. It may be that someone on his return from a day's hunt, regardless of the course of his discharge, fired off his gun as a precautionary measure of safety to his family after reaching his house. In the end, Lincoln wanted the entire matter hushed up. He instructed Private Nichols that the event should be kept quiet and told Lemon, the whole thing seems farcical. No good can result at this time from giving it publicity. 
It does seem to me that I am more in danger from the augmentation of an imaginary peril than from a judicious silence, be the danger ever so great. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out my new channel? It's called Highlight History. It's sort of a today in history thing that is linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.